Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 11th and final installment of the New Jersey Flute Society Gives Back Q&A series. My name is Kristen Bakiyaki Stewart, and I am the co-president of the New Jersey Flute Society. I am joined tonight by Katie Massad, who is the host of the Flute Unscripted podcast and resident flutist of the Flute Center of New York. The Flute Center of New York is the 2020 Virtual Young Artists and High School Competitions sponsor for the New Jersey Flute Society Flute Fair. Tonight, we welcome 2020 Virtual Flute Fair guest artist, Jim Walker. Mr. Walker is the flute professor of the University of Southern California and the Colburn Conservatory, a member of Free Flight, and director and founder of Beyond the Masterclass. We are so very excited to welcome Jim Walker. Thank you. It's great to be here. Looking forward to uh, being the guest artist and looking forward to this interview. Thank you so much. Yeah. Jim, it's really, really great to meet you. This is the first time um, that we've met and I haven't seen you in New York yet. Hopefully that day will come very soon when you can travel out here again. Um, but uh, we're kind of wondering during the tough times of quarantine and everything kind of hit, um, how are you coping with the sudden shift in your routine and being in quarantine? It's probably not dissimilar from almost every colleague that I've spoken to. Uh, it's a matter of kind of in some ways reinventing yourself. Uh, I think a lot of us were in some some fragmented way prepared for being online. I actually started teaching Skype lessons online eight or 10 years ago. I didn't do it a lot. I didn't really promote it a lot, but I was at least comfortable with trying to have a successful uh, lesson where I really felt like I could give something to a student. So that wasn't a shocking change. Um, I would say that in general, the main thing that I found is that as a teacher, I, and as kind of a, a would be try to get it together guy, I thought, oh man, I'm gonna have more time now than I've ever had in my life. And I told my students the same thing. You've got time now to do all of these things that you've always dreamed about. Fast forward to six weeks later, we're all depressed. We're all doing about 10% of what we thought we would be doing. Uh, that book we were gonna write, the etudes, all of this, uh, it was like we suddenly realized we had to survive. So as a teacher, it's, it's important, I think, that you're honest with your students. I mean, my struggles weren't monumental, but they were certainly surprising to me because I'm a, a super go-getter, uh, you know, ants in my pants kind of guy, always got some sort of project happening. And all of a sudden, I say, you know, a month later, it's like I, I d hadn't even made a move towards some of the things that I knew that I was gonna be doing. So, you know, I was real comfortable revealing that to my students or anyone else. I did find that a lot of the homeowners activities that I like to do that they took a higher place in the priority list. So for me, that was more my adjustment being at home and actually taking care of things around the house that I like to do, but never really had a chance to do it. Then the other thing is just trying to deal with the technology to make it more comfortable for my students to try to get more aware, more alert to what I needed to be doing as a teacher. So it's a very long answer, but, uh, it, I'm still adjusting. I mean, we're talking what seven or eight months later. I can't even count that far. Yeah. But um, yeah. you know, every every lesson is a new adventure in terms of is Zoom working? Is the new update happening? What about MF classrooms? What about audio movers? What about the, I heard that there's just gaming software that really has great sound and blah 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 blah. blah. <laughs> anyway, I'm my my head is still spinning. <laughs> That's interesting. You've been doing it, you know, Skype lessons for quite a long time, even before. Uh, all of this. So what do you think are some main, it makes me wonder what are some main um, perks of Skype lessons and what are some big drawbacks that you're still having, you know, you're still struggling with? I would say the main drawback is the tech, is not the technology, but the uh, inconsistency of the internet. Yeah. Uh, between students, even from day to day, uh, it's very important that the kids have at least some functioning internet uh, and then <laughs> I didn't even mention the time zone issues because a lot of my students are still in Asia. Some of them have been in Europe and to try to get all of that, that's, that's one heck of a big challenge. 
but probably uh, just in terms of navigating uh, an online lesson, I feel like there are many things that that actually reveal themselves as well as an in-person situation. One is unless unless the internet is horrible, you can actually tell about suspicious rhythm, especially wrong rhythm. Not so much slowing up and speeding, uh, slowing down and speeding up, but if someone's playing triplets and they should be playing sixteenths, you can hear that. You can hear intonation pretty well. You can almost hear dynamics well. Dynamics are the biggest area where you can't really tell what you hear in a live setting. You right. certainly can tell what's going on with the student's vibrato. That, uh, and to me, that's, that's one of my main keys in teaching. So as a teacher, uh, you know, having done it now, hundreds of hours, it feels like, I know what my limitations are, and I have found that the most effective way to teach the lessons is for a student to submit at least half of the lesson material in a recording, in a pre-recorded either audio or video. And in fact, I'll be carrying that forward to when I resume live teaching. I found that a, probably a third of my students who did active recording to submit things for either a studio class or a lesson that their playing actually went up. Their level of consistency, their level of execution definitely hit a higher level. Mm -hmm. So uh, whenever this does change back to the good old days, I'm going to have every student have submitted uh, some recording to me so that we're sitting there together, listening, watching that recording, starting and stopping. I, I feel like it's really the next level of good teaching. I feel the same way, definitely. Yeah. And when things are um, back to normal Sunday, what will you take with you from these past few months? Well, certainly the recording. Uh, that's that's going to be a I've always preached that the recorder is your best teacher, but now it's just there in my face. So that may be the number one thing I would say. Also, <laughs> Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. I mean, we could be doing this for another year. I mean, yeah. you just don't know. Uh, the world and our country in particular don't seem prepared to really deal with this in a way that, that we have some insight about going forward. I mean, I, I would not be shocked that both USC and Coburn were remote for the whole year. Nobody said that, but I'm telling you, I would not be shocked. Yeah. Uh, I certainly hope not. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's it's a big sacrifice for the students, way yeah. more sacrifice than for the teachers. I mean, a lot of my colleague teachers were not at all savvy with technology and were incredibly fearful about it. But every school that I've heard about, including the two I work for, they've done everything they can to kind of babysit all of us and get us up to speed so that we're functional. That's great. You were um, talking about doing some projects around the house. So do you have any old hobbies any new hobbies that you've picked up oh i'm the king of jack of all trades and almost a master of a couple uh i'm a tool collector i used to repair flutes uh i had a whole bunch of heavy tools woodworking tools so i almost cut off this third finger but uh -oh. uh, so my, we're getting rid of the radio alarm so uh i just love my dad was a, a band director but he was a, a first class carpenter he built like virtually every piece of furniture in their in their home. And he and I did a couple of woodworking projects when we first moved here. So I love just going to my cave. And that's this little shed I have in the side of the house. I'll just go and maybe sharpen some knives. That's fun. You know, <laughs> our garden's looking better than it used to. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of hobbies, I mean, I'm a total sports junkie. So my golf game has definitely gotten better in the last six months. Nice. Um, I do try to play tennis at least uh, once every week or so. So yeah. those those are pretty much my hobbies. I uh, think that gets it. Any books that you can recommend that you've been reading lately? You know what? I'm. It's so interesting. I am not much of a reader. I uh, and I cannot justify it, except I never will forget when I first moved to L.A., I heard an interview with a pretty well-known comedian. It was on The Tonight Show and Johnny Carson said, so what books are you reading lately? So, well, John, um, 
I'm not really much of a reader. I, I want to be the guy that they write books about. So I love that. <laughs> so that's that's my excuse. However, uh, I have three children, an uh, older son and the daughter. And the, son. the two boys are voracious readers, absolutely voracious readers. And my youngest son is a writer. He's a writer on a comedy show. And uh, cool. my daughter, in the meantime, she and I are the kind of the non-readers. Yeah. I like that though. You want you want people to write books about you. I'm sure that they will. <laughs> All right, so we're going to change gears a little bit here. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, Burkhart Flutes and Piccolos is sponsoring you for our virtual flute fair on October 18th. And as a Burkhart artist, it must have been a really proud moment for you since Lillian Burkhart had studied with you. And we learned that because she also did an, a Q&A with us. So we were fascinated with that. Um, please tell us how you came to be a Burkhart artist. Uh, I'll, I'll try not to give you the 30 minute story, but um, uh, a lot of people know I was a Yamaha performing artist for 25 years. I had a great relationship with that company. They're very, very supportive of any educational effort that I made. And in particular, their student model flutes were just off the charts. I felt like they were the most consistent things. And I had a, a good pro level flute that I played for 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, all along, I knew Jim Phelan and Lillian, obviously, and I knew what their products were and had stayed in touch with them and probably 12 or 13 years ago, Jim came to LA and just posed the question, would you ever be interested in changing allegiance uh, if, if it made any sense? And so we talked and I had, I had kind of made a pact with myself that I was not going to be one of these guys who jumped from company to company looking for the best deal, the best deal. Uh, we don't have many of those anyway. But uh, it turns out that the, the main compelling reason, aside from the fact that I love Lillian and incredible respect for, for Jim and for their products, they wanted to make more of an international uh, effort in marketing and in selling things. And as a Yamaha artist, I was pretty much restricted to the States. Uh, a lot of support in the States, but not really internationally at all. And that was a big enough difference that I decided, well, let's see what you've got going. I tried their instruments. They blew me away. And uh, it was great. So it was a beginning of a nice relationship. That's awesome. An ongoing relationship, right? Yeah. Very much <laughs> I also so. play a Burkhart. I love, I love my flute. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's, look, the truth of the matter is there are more great flutes today than there ever, than we ever imagined 20 and 30 years ago. Right. The, the level of flute makers and repairmen has just gone off the charts. So mm -hmm. it's a nice thing, but certainly the, the Burkhardt flutes, I love them. That's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. um, we were all wondering, how did you end up in Los Angeles? And can you describe some of your first memories as a flutist establishing roots in the LA music scene? Uh, well, I'll tell you this, in 1957, when I was 13 years old, I came to Los Angeles with my great uncle, my godfather, and spent a month. I probably grew five inches, probably gained 30 pounds, and loved Southern California, and <laughs> kind of hoped at that point I could come back. Fast forward to when I was at uh, in the West Point Band uh, in the late 60s, I got a little vacation that the Army gave me a plane ticket to California. I had a different uncle who also lived in California, and when I landed, in February to palm trees in the sun, that was another signal, you know, LA would be great. <laughs> but then fast forward a, a year later, I actually won my job in the Pittsburgh Symphony in 1969 and uh, started that job. Three years in, uh, a position opened up in the LA Philharmonic and I decided, oh man, got to audition for it. You have to. <laughs> so I did. And I played a good audition, and at the end of the first two, first round, the first day, I was the last man standing. Standing, however, Zubin Mehta said there's still two people we need to hear, so we'll we'll keep you posted. Two weeks later, 
the other two people came and played and he liked them better than he liked me. So I didn't get the gig. So that was in 1972 or three. Fast forward to 1977, the other flute job opened up so that Zubin Mehta wanted to create co-principal flutes. Mm -hmm. And that time I was way more prepared. I really, really wanted the job and went to work hard. Thank God I won the job. Um, so I moved in August of 1977, moved to Los Angeles, uh, big move. I actually had a recent divorce. Uh, it was just an incredible change of life for me. I kind of, I was 33 at the time. And amongst other things, I was kind of going back to my roots, especially my musical roots, because as a teenager, as kind of a Kentucky high school band guy with a father who was my band director, but the father was also a really great jazz player. Mm -hmm. I had grown up listening to jazz and kind of being a, a jazz hacker, a decent saxophone player, played clarinet, and going to college, I kind of imagined I'd be a woodwind doubler but I wasn't w willing to really work on the sax or the clarinet. So during college, I decided, okay, try to be a, a classical flutist. But I had put jazz completely on the back burner, in fact, out of my life. Hmm. Getting back to LA, it was like, I often say it was my third midlife crisis. And, <laughs> and it was really coming to grips with the fact that I'd never really confronted, for me, a demon of not being able to improvise. And at that time, there was a series of uh, improvisation books created by Jamie Abersold uh, that had a book and a play along LP. And I got into that. And for the first three years in the LA Philharmonic, I would go to, I would play the LA Phil concert. Afterwards, I would go to a jazz club, hear amazing live jazz in Los Angeles, and then go home, single in those days, and practice improv for two or three hours. Oh, wow. Get up and go to a rehearsal the next day. So that's another long-winded answer, but basically I ended up in Los Angeles because I won the job, thank God. And uh, those first three years were really great years with Carlo Maria Giulini. We traveled, we did world tours, uh, we made recordings, and I was practicing basically in the closet, my improv. And at the same time, I, in those years, got to know James Galway quite well. And uh, he was very inspiring to me in that he was someone who had a stable orchestra job in the Berlin Philharmonic, but had felt compelled to leave to start a different career, obviously, as a soloist. Right. And I never really looked at myself as a potential classical flute soloist, but I did know that I had this other chapter evolving. So in 1980, uh, I organized a group, free, my jazz quartet, Free Flight. It was basically a jazz classical group. I would say in the in the beginning, pretty much 60% jazzified classics and then 40% kind of jazz music. Mm -hmm. So things, you know, evolved from there. And I realized that that was really where my passion lay in terms of my musical path. I really worked hard in those days just to memorize a lot of really difficult jazz music, a lot of difficult chord changes, all of that stuff. So I was really inspired as a musician to try to get to another level. I, you know, obviously kept up my classical chops enough to be a decent orchestral player and the occasional concerto here and there. But I really did, I really loved the cohesiveness and the fireworks that I could have in a quartet and that very often we would play a concert and at the end of the concert people stood up they <laughs> applauded it was like whoa they're doing that for the four of us that felt pretty cool yeah. so i got way way off track on the answer but coming to los angeles was an absolute dream come true for me uh i was a as i said a kind of a frustrated athlete all my life loving warm weather sports so even in pittsburgh I played golf whenever the weather permitted, but there was a core of about seven or eight of us in the Pittsburgh Symphony who played ten tennis throughout the whole year in t tennis bubbles. Oh, wow. Uh, that kind of helped us have our little moments of sanity. So it was, it, yeah, like you said, it was a dream come true. And, it really was. You know, for for many years you've you've been there. So that's, that's fabulous. It's so good to hear people, you know, getting what they really truly want and, are able to live in a place where they love and 
you know, you're able to do your sports that you like to do and that's all year round. That's, that's amazing. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I definitely, uh, I, I don't want to get gooey about it, but a day does not go by that. I don't just kiss the earth and say thanks for, you know, the way things fell into place for me. I've, I've worked very hard at the right times, mm -hmm. tried to be a good person, but you know, I'm, I've been blessed with a really, uh, a wonderful life. Yeah. It's important to have that gratitude. That's, that's great. Um, and what are you, what do you feel are some ways that ja the jazz side of your career has benefited your teaching and classical playing? I think the, the main thing is that most of us as strict classical flutists rarely get deeply into harmony. Uh, we, we rarely do much analysis so that we really f kind of know what the, the scope of a composition is that we're pretty much single line players. We learn to really do that well. We often learn how to fit it well with an accompaniment, but in terms of kind of knowing where the harmonies are, what they are, uh, that really, that certainly helped me in my own playing. And as a teacher, I feel like one of the keys to, to learning the hieroglyphics of notation is that one has to be able to look at a group of notes and to, to be able to see those as a single idea. That is a chromatic scale. That is a C major triad. That is a D dominant seventh. Beyond that, there are some very, very big words about many of the harmonies that we see. And the more I worked on my jazz, the more I could see these secondary, tertiary dominance and all sorts of crazy chord changes and permutations and alterations, which certainly helped me grow uh, on the confidence department is being someone who knew more than I used to, but in terms of especially playing etudes, uh, the standard etudes, I really push my students to analyze those rather than just to play them to the point that they kind of have them from memory and they know that this pattern feels like this, but they need to know it's a D half to many seventh, come on. Mm -hmm. If I ask you to play a G half to many seventh, could you do that? What? What no. is that? <laughs> yeah, that's so important, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I was going to ask you um, another facet of your playing that a lot of people are familiar with our movie scores. Um, so we're wondering what film scores are some of your favorites that you've played on? And do you have any stories, favorite stories or anecdotes about playing in these orchestras and the studio recording setting? Yeah, I mean, they're. I could tell you a lot of stories. Uh, my memory <laughs> still holds quite a few of them. I would say this, the, I mean, I start, my first gig in the studios was uh, as a substitute on the Little House on the Prairie back in probably uh -huh. 1978 or 79. And uh, I, I got called in to substitute for Louise de Tullio, who was absolutely the queen of the studios for decades uh, a wonderful flutist and just always delivered the goods and a very lovely woman who was very nice to me when i left the orchestra in 1985 and kind of officially became more of a studio player she was always very gracious uh whereas not necessarily everybody would be when you know someone comes in potentially to take your work away but i'll always have the deepest respect for yeah. the way the me. to break into even these days. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I, when I first came to LA, I would get, let's say by the early eighties, when I was starting to do session work, I would get questions whenever I do master classes. Like, I, I, wanna, I wanna do that, what, what should I do? I'd say, well, you, you'd probably need to move to Los Angeles at that point, you know, it's still the big city for doing it. And you need to give yourself at least five years before you ever scratch the surface of getting a real gig. Yeah. That changed to 15 years, at least 10 to 15 years ago, because the pot did not get larger, but the pool of flute players is enormous of people who are really good players. And the, the whole break in scenario for me, I, I basically had a ticket because I was, I had credibility as principal flute of the LA Phil. So that first sub job that I got came because 
In fact, you might know Glenn Dictoreau was a former concert master of the New York Philharmonic. His father, yeah. Harold Dictoreau, was in the LA Phil, and Harold and two or three of the other older string players used to do some sessions, and especially for a composer named David Rose, who did Bonanza, Little House on the Prairie, and all of the Michael Landon television shows of the 70s and 80s. And David asked Harold Dictoreau, tell me about this new flute player in the LA field. Do you think we should give him a shot? And supposedly Harold said, yeah, he's a good player. Uh, if you, I think he'd be good. And I did get a call to come substitute and I didn't blow it basically. Uh, but I didn't have to stay in the trenches for two or three years playing free rehearsals, doing every possible gig under the sun to start building a network that, that didn't exist before I moved to town. So the LA Phil was not so much a network, but it gave me credibility because if you got that job, you at least played well enough in one day to win a job. So I, um, I enjoyed it from the beginning. I especially enjoyed the money. And um, in the words of one of my friends, the session work is there are two great days, the day that you get a call and the day that you get the check. And the other, the other quote, a lot of us have said, studios are, you know, 90% boring, 10% sure terror. And one other quote from one of my all time buddies said, Jimmy, it's grand larceny. I'm telling you. <laughs> now that was the good old days when you might do three movie calls in a day or like one unforgettable session was with uh, Barbara Streisand uh, on the movie called The Prince of Tides. Oh, I love that movie. It was a good movie. And wow. James Newton Howard was a composer of that, a wonderful composer. And at the time, he was actually dating Barbara. So uh, after we had done the scoring for the whole week, uh, they set up a, a vocal recording session, not a film scoring session, for her to sing the lead for the movie, the song. So here we are, we finished the session at five or six, and then we came back at eight o'clock and to play, to do this song. And the orchestra gathers, we've got our headphones on, the single can generally, Barbara is back in the booth. And I'd never worked, uh, I'd never heard her live. We read through the, the piece and we hear her voice and it's just like, oh. No, no wonder she's part of right and it's amazing. Well, the session became even more amazing because they didn't like the arrangement and we didn't have enough string players. So at nine o'clock, we took a break to call, I think something like 12 or 16 more string players. We started recording again around 11 or 12 and we finished, I think at three in the morning. Oh. Wow. <laughs> that was quite a session. Uh, coffee, coffee, coffee. Yeah, they brought in pizza, I think, at midnight, too. That wasn't a bad. We needed that. Uh, <laughs> in terms of favorites for me, you know, from a purely selfish standpoint, where I was featured, those are pretty big favorites uh, of mine. The very first one I did with John Williams was a movie called The River, 1985 or 86. And it was when I first left the LA Phil. It was a Mel Gibson, Sissy Spacek movie. And uh, John Williams wanted to feature kind of a bluesy flute and a 12 string guitar and a trumpet along with the or in the orchestra setting. And it's just a, incredible score that had a lot of really beautiful flute features. That was fun. A few years later, a movie called Nell, a uh, Jodie Foster movie. That was uh, a fantastic movie too. Mark, Mark Isham was the composer on that. And I had wall-to-wall -wall solos, especially alto flute. What was memorable about that session was normally in, in the orchestra setting, you've, you're a little more separate in, in a fairly big room. You might have a microphone as close as four or five feet above your head. And then in the center of the room, they have what's called the tree with the major microphones for the whole orchestra. Well, Mark on this particular one wanted a really intimate sound on the flute. So I can show you a little prop. The engineer, I need to get rid of my virtual background. Let me do this. 
though you can see this worth it. <laughs> so my virtual background says, oh, there we go. here's my flute. Mm -hmm. He had the microphone right here. <laughs> so no. after, uh. after one take, the engineer oh. comes on and says, a gym, <laughs> the, um, the, the sound is great. However, every time you touch your lips, it sounds like a firecracker is going off. And I had the habit of, before I would play, I'd do my lips like. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> so I had to go. I mean, <laughs> so weird to not be able to touch my lips. Anyway, oh my gosh. We, got, we got through it and uh, it was a great movie. I mean, a really wonderful soundtrack. Um, another one, uh, movie that was a personal favorite because I did tons of ethnic flutes was called the Joy Luck Club. Uh, mm. And I just had wall to wall bamboo flutes that were really challenging from the standpoint I had to transpose almost everything that I had to do. And I had these great flutes that I bought at a flute convention one time. Normally uh, a, a bonsai or any bamboo flute is a six hole flute. Mm -hmm. So it's just got a diatonic scale. But this very creative guy had built an eight hole flute where on the right hand you had four holes and on the left hand you had a thumb hole and then the other three holes. The tricky thing was that when you played the right hand closed with all four fingers down, it was a low D. So I had to get used to the fact that this is D and that's E and that's F and that's F sharp. Oh my gosh. So kind of like learning Baroque flute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really was. But I did really I loved the challenge. And it was interesting also, uh, when I got to those sessions the first day, they actually had another gentleman who was supposed to be doing the ethnic flutes. And I believe uh, Rachel Portman was the composer. And she was asking for certain things. And this other guy was an amazing player, but he simply said, I can't do it, it's imp impossible, cannot be done. <laughs> so the contractor came to me and said, Jim, do you have your ethnic flutes with you? I think I was playing probably second flute in the section, I don't know. And I said, yeah, I've got them. I used to carry, you know, basically 50 to 100 recorders and crazy flutes in the trunk of my car. So I went and got them and uh, settled in. And for the rest of the sessions, I did those. So that that was very gratifying. Another John Williams movie was called Far and Away. And I did, they had the chieftains there. It's a Tom, uh, Tom Cruise movie. The chieftains were there as like guest artists. One of my favorite movies. <laughs> uh, so the and John wrote this amazingly difficult penny whistle stuff that we had to play in the orchestra. And so one of my dear, dear friend colleagues, uh, an oboist named Phil Ailing, he and I did, we worked many, many years together. We're both retired from the studios now, but we both were pretty good at the penny whistle. And so for this movie, he and I would go back and forth on some of these ridiculous. I would go. <laughs> and uh, that's so much was, fun. That was really, really a lot of fun. I also, for that movie, three days before we filmed it, the contractor called me and said, uh, Jim, the um, pan flute player is not going to be able to come because he has a visa issue. Could you play the pan flutes? And I was like, oh my God. All right. Uh, I own pan flutes. I, I will I will agree to do it if you'll put me in isolation. So anything that I record will not destroy what the orchestra is doing. And when I was doing the pan flutes, that was the most stressful thing I ever did in an all video career. Uh, so, yeah, those are favorites. I also, uh, God, I loved working on Catch Me If You Can. That, oh, that's that's me. Just that music really, really touched me. I, I didn't have a lot to play on the flute. There was another movie that Alexandre Desplat scored called uh, Benjamin Button, what is the Curious? What is yeah, it? Curious Life of Benjamin Button, yes. Yeah. And Alexander is a former flutist. He actually went to uh, one of the French conservatories as a flute performance oh, person. Wow. 
Wow. And so it was pretty cool. One uh, on these sessions one day, he actually came back, tried my flute, actually played Daphnis on it. So <laughs> I really could play. But I loved that score because he had the ingenuity to voice alto flute, viola, and soprano sax playing unisons throughout. And no, I've, I've got my movies wrong. First of all, yeah, that's Benjamin Button. Catch Me If You Can was just John Williams' jazz score that I love, love, loved playing. Yeah, cool. So yeah, I could name a bunch of other movies, you know, other crazy things that happened in the studios, at least on four or five occasions, I had to go someplace quickly afterwards. I walked out of the studio with my flute still sitting on the peg and I would get a phone call later. Oh, Jim, there's a flute in the studio here. <laughs> Anyway, I survived it all. Well, we've covered a lot of your successes and your accomplishments, uh, a lot of the highs. Can you share some of the low moments, maybe some struggles that, that you had to face in the past and how you think, um, you know, the, this future generation of flutists, um, you know, if they're facing some of the same struggles that you have or if you think that things are a little bit different for them now? Things are radically different, but the the one thing that I'll have to preach the rest of my life is that the life of an artist is all about learning to deal with rejection. No matter what area you're in, you're going to be rejected way more than you're going to be accepted. And it doesn't mean you're not a genius, brilliant musician, artist, or whatever. But you've got to understand that it's not just a matter it wasn't your day. You could have had the best day of your life and it just wasn't what they were looking for. So I don't know that I'm really successful in, in the message that's worked for me, but a lot of my, let's say a lot of my willingness to be rather spread thin and to have a lot of different irons in the fire is a protective mechanism. Uh, and a lot of it occurred just as a kid uh, when I didn't grow up with very much. The fact that I would get could earn 50 cents an hour working on a farm and at the end of a week I might get an $11 check, that was thrilling to me. So that has always been kind of a bedrock with me so that I've always, I've always taught. While I was in college I taught a lot of lessons. I started doing flute repairs when I was in college. Uh, you know, in high school, I worked as a disc jockey on a radio station. I, during Christmas, would wrap gifts at a department store. Uh, and I, I've always had a willingness to do almost anything in order not to starve. And the, the standing joke between me and my wife is that, in her words, if it all goes to hell in a handbasket, I know you'll be at the 7-Eleven pumping gas and selling whatever. And I would. Uh, and and having that that safety net uh, that that's always there for me, it, it's really been helpful. I, I've told a lot of my colleagues over the years, I didn't feel safe unless I really had like four jobs going at once, and that's why I'm fortunate to still have both the teaching jobs, but the various things that I still continue to do well past when I should be retired, is that. You know, I, I do enjoy getting paid to work and there's nothing like working with brilliant young students. I mean, it's right now, I may have the best crop of students I've ever had in my whole life just because everybody's getting better. And I'm telling you, when I look back over the years at the number of great students that I had, oh my God, I had some ridiculous classes that at the time I knew they were great, but they've all gone on and done this and that. So I would say my main message to anyone who's listening to this is that you have to, you have to cultivate resilience and you also have to create victories. Uh, even if they're momentary victories that you have by playing a beautiful diminuendo of actually playing an interval that you actually crafted it the way that you want to. Those are the kinds of things that have to keep you going. I mean, the analogy I make, I just played golf this morning. So the first half of the round, I was not putting well. And for me, that's like missing some notes on the flute. It's like, I, I wasn't just missing notes. Why was I missing notes? What, what could I do? Oh, maybe 
maybe this ring finger. Yeah, it probably was lazy. Well, today with putting, I realized I was doing something that I shouldn't be doing with the putting. So having that kind of mind of, of wanting to problem solve and not just beat myself up or feel sorry for myself because I didn't get the gig, that's, that's kept me going and kept me essentially positive. I mean, I will go to my grave saying it was a good life and trying to be positive. Great message. Yeah, that message. Well, talking about your students uh, is a good segue into our segment on teaching. Um, if you don't mind talking about your studios at USC and Colburn, uh, we were wondering what you found to be the most rewarding aspects of university teaching. Well, the most rewarding aspect in general is seeing personal growth. That's at every school or every private lesson I've ever taught. If I compare a conservatory to a university, the most rewarding thing is to see an academically brilliant flutist be able to do both things, to be able to become a, an amazing scholar. I had a graduate last year who I was runner up for valedictorian. He got a double major in biochemical engineering and flute performance. And to just be a witness to somebody who worked that hard and had that much talent to really achieve, that certainly would not have happened at a conservatory. Uh, the challenges at a university are that you have to balance academics with your routines, your, uh, your musical path, and that's a struggle. But I'm pretty understanding about that. And I also, even at both schools, but especially at the university, I, I do, part of my counsel is, especially in the first year, look, you got four years. I want these, these potentially are the best four years of your life. And I want you to work really hard, but I really want you to have fun. I want you to enjoy being away from home. I want to see you grow up. I want to see you learn to be socially viable in whatever situations you find yourself. Colburn's a little bit different as are most conservatories because it's way smaller, way more narrow. And I still have that same kind of goal. So I push my students, get out of that residential tower, go down to little Tokyo, you know, eat some sushi, have, have a getaway, maybe even try to make a friend outside of Colburn. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, and what, what do you listen for when you audition students for your studios? I would say I, I've, I look at myself very much like, a, going back to the sports junkie stuff, as a NCAA coach of some sort, where I'm trying to identify talent, overall talent. Uh, so I'm always keen to see someone who has, first of all, a real spirit in what they do, certainly a high level of execution, but maybe the most overriding and significant issue is the sound. If someone makes a sound, even in the warm up, and I always encourage my students to warm or anyone who's auditioning for me, get comfortable, play a couple of notes. I always have an idea about what might be coming from that warm up. And I can tell you, I've actually accepted a couple of students over the last 30 years based on their warm up, because I knew that they had something in the sound that I was just really looking forward to seeing where that could go. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, a coach is looking for the best athlete, not necessarily the best, best free throw shooter or best kicker of the ball, looking for the best athlete. I'm looking for the best possible musician. But if they've got a good sound, big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really true. Um, what inspired you to start your Beyond the Masterclass series? It's interesting. I was just, uh, we're purging a bunch of old stuff. And uh, my major teacher was Harold Bennett uh, in the Metropolitan Opera. And back in those days, he and Julius Baker and Sam Barron were kind of the, the big teachers in New York, Tom Knifinger to some degree. And I went with Baker because, I mean, with uh, Bennett, because he was highly recommended by someone who had studied with him. And I actually didn't feel like I was in the league to study with Julius Baker. But um, 
why am I going off on this tangent? <laughs> what, what did you ask me? <laughs> I just asked you what, what inspired you to start your Beyond the Masterclass series. Yes. So I'm going, I'm purging all of this stuff. And there I find a, a brochure for Julius Baker's Masterclass that somehow I had met him, I think, when I did the tour. Uh, I played first flute in the New York Philharmonic, substituting for him in 1982. And I think uh, my wife at the time, Judy, and I went to visit them uh, in their home in Brewster. And he gave me this brochure. And he had this beautiful quote to me on, you know, flowery, all of this stuff. Anyway, he was legendary for having a summer camp every year. And it was always in the back of my mind that I would do that at some point. And 13 years ago, uh, one of my students at the time, Greg Millerin, who's now the associate principal of flute of the Minneapolis Symphony. He was my student at Colburn. Actually, he'd already graduated, but was still in LA. And I said, how about uh, helping me organize a master class? And we came up with the title Beyond the Master Class. And I definitely wanted to do a few unique things uh, to get into a few different things since, you know, I did the movies, I generally tried to com include a little component of that, the improvisation, uh, especially mock auditions for orchestra. So it's evolved over the years, but it was, it was basically wanting to jump on that train of summer flute classes and do it my way. It's exciting yeah. when you're able to do that. Yeah. You were uh, just mentioning Harold Bennett. Uh, you studied with James Pellerate as well. Uh, can you share a little bit about how your teachers have shaped your teaching philosophy and the way that you approach students? Yeah, uh, my most important teacher probably was my dad, who was a legendary band director back in Western Kentucky in this tiny little town. And he was 100% honest with every student all the time about whether it was good or whether it wasn't good. He was never really intentionally unkind to a student. He would say the occasional sarcastic thing that students to this, this day will tell me, you remember what your dad said to me? Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> anyway, that, that affected me a lot about the honesty of you, you need to share with your students what you're hearing. And hopefully our ears as teachers are cultivated to a higher and higher level. Uh, my teacher for two summers in high school was Sarah Faust, who passed away uh, not too long ago. I had her for two, three week sessions. I would say what she was great for me because I was kind of the hot Western Kentucky band kid who actually didn't know what I was doing. And she was really gracious not to just completely burst my bubble. And she kind of gave me a nice wake up call in as nice a way as could happen. Then my college flute teacher was Francis Fuge and he was perfect for me because I was, I didn't know what I was doing. I was a good flute player, but I was playing saxophone in a rock and roll band every weekend. I would come in for a Saturday flute lesson. My lip would be swollen and I couldn't make a sound. He was very cool about that. and. Basically, he, he guided me through the morass that I <laughs> created for myself. It, it worked because at least by my senior year, I got to become a member of the Louisville Orchestra where he was the principal flutist. So I learned be nice to your students from him. And in my senior year is when I took uh, four lessons from James Pellerite. And those were shocking in a way that he really really hit me hard with some amateur things, which I know he was right about, but I was looking at that point to really be encouraged to go to school, study with him. And I didn't get that. And in fact, I was pretty devastated by the fact that I didn't get the encouragement that I thought I deserved. Well, he was being true to himself. I mean, he always called a spade a spade with his students. So the fact that he actually taught me how not to press in so hard was a great thing. In terms of what I learned from him, from him teaching, I learned not to do what he did to me. And so as a matter of fact, I never want to say anything to a student that sets them back, but I always want to be 100% honest. Um, I had two or three lessons with Claude Monteux, 
incredibly important lessons in that one of them was when I was 19 and trying to decide how serious I would be about being a woodwind doubler. He said, Jim, I've never heard a, would a saxophone player be a great classical flute player. Just that's what I think. And that devastated me, but he was right. But when I got to LA, I did actually hear saxophone players who were good classical flutists. So then you get to Harold Bennett and he was just the right guy at the right time. He uh, was playing the flute incredibly well. I think it was probably in his mid sixties. He, he was retired from the Met, but he was just the perfect guy at the right time. He put me in Anderson Opus 33. I'd never had anyone demand that I play anything perfect in my life and I couldn't do it. And that really was a wake up call, but it was always very, very subtly sarcastic and encouraging. And he always had that vibraphone behind him so that when I played any note out of tune, he would ding the proper pitch. And it was like, oh my God, how, how flat could that A sharp be? At any rate, uh, he was just the right guy at the right time. And I wouldn't have had my career without him. And uh, do you have some method books in the works too that you can share well, a little bit? You know what I have, I'm actually having a conversation with a publisher tomorrow morning. I've oh. got, I've got the makings of a, a, a big, big series of books. I, since I got my first computer in the mid eighties, I've been creating exercises and all sorts of things. And it's just a matter of honestly trying to put together 1500 pages of stuff. So we'll see. I'm hoping it happens before I die. That's all. <laughs> well, you always seem to be looking ahead and looking, uh, you said yourself, you're very uh, goal oriented and have lots of, of things going at the same time. Um, so I think that's one of them. Um, is there anything else that you're, you're looking forward to or any project you have on the horizon? Uh, I've got a really big golf tournament this weekend. I'm <laughs> very much looking forward to. Oh, good luck. Uh, I'm actually uh, considering doing some live flute and piano jazz broadcast in the coming months with the Great. two pianists that I've worked with over the years. Uh, we can do it socially distanced in my living room. And I haven't even talked to either of them about it, but I think it's time. Uh, the truth of the matter is I'm, I still consider myself a really good teacher of the classical flute my ability to do on the flute what I know I should be doing, especially in the sound department, is diminished. Uh, I mean, I'm 76 years old. It's not as good as it should be. It's pretty good. But I'm probably getting close to the point that I'm not going to play a lot of classical recitals anymore because it's just not up to the standard. And I, one of the reasons I left the studios 13 years ago was that there's an incredibly high standard that I do not want to be remembered as going on the downhill. When it comes to playing jazz or doing those kinds of tunes, those limited skills don't show up. So that's probably going to be more and more my direction, although my teaching will always be 98% the classical flute. Sure. Fantastic. Well, look forward, I look forward to that. So I hope that happens. I, 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 I've got, I'll make it happen. I've just got to, got to make it happen. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> you will. I, I can tell. <laughs> well, Jim, thank you so much for sharing your evening with us. I know that our community will be so happy to hear about your life and work and all your stories. Um, thank you to our viewers for tuning in. And we hope to see you at our virtual flute fair on Sunday, October 18th. Please come and visit our exhibitors and sponsors, uh, the Flute Center of New York, Flute Perfection, Flute Pro Shop, Burkhart Flutes and Piccolos, and William Haynes uh, Flute and Company. We have a wonderful day in, in store for you. And if you would like to take a sneak peek at the events for the day, please visit www.NewJerseyFluteFair.org. Thank you again to Jim and Katie, and have a great night.